I guess you guys couldn't help but get the feeling that the audience was very familiar with the material. Yeah, we were really, yeah. uh, really happy about that. Mm -hmm. It was. Uh, we're used to people reacting like that to the hits, but uh, not always when reacting to a song like Sales, like that. I mean, it's a. Uh, so it was it was a thrill for us. I mean, we've been looking forward to coming here for years. I, I don't know why we never got here before, <laughs> but uh, I'm glad we're finally here. Mm -hmm. Well, look, there was only two kids, so we got a couple of ear hears in the back. This is the verification of the reputation we'd always heard about for your live performance, live prowess, sort of uh, verified on the rumors. Well, that's. That's, that's good to hear, and you know that's why we did the live record because uh, our our fans in the United States also have always said that Orleans was uh, a unique live band, and uh, that it was a shame we had never done a live record. And when when Robbie Dupree approached us last spring about it, um, he he managed to talk us into it, and we've been so, always been so demanding. Uh, Larry and I, I think both, maybe more so than the other guys in the band in our own way are very demanding about what we put out. We don't want to re release a record unless it's exactly what we want it to be. And sometimes that's uh, a problem. You can, uh, it can wind up sort of uh, cramping your style and making you uh, self-conscious. And, and, <clears throat> and uh, originally they were going to record live to, uh, uh, to digital two-track. Well, yeah. It was going to be mixed, you know, recorded direct to digital. And, uh, so we talked about it and decided that instead we were going to record 24 tracks and then we would be able to control the mix down and if there was something that uh, needed to be fixed we would be able to, to fix it. But uh, uh, it, it really was about time. It wound up being, as Larry and I were saying before, it's probably the most representative record. It's a better representation of Orleans than any of the studio records that we've done. Hmm. 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 I think. For, uh, it was, if I could add it, it was, I think, the easiest record to make yes. of all the ones that we've done, and uh, and the most I think fun. All things definitely the most fun, and for me, all things considered, my favorite record for all those reasons because it is representative and because it was easy and fun, hmm. which is what music, uh, you know, what part of it is about. Uh -huh. well, the performance on the record was so good that you got a feeling you guys were fudging it, yeah, that you would like lay down tracks afterwards, but last night's <laughs> performance proved it to be. Um, well, not. We rarely play the exact same guitars unless one of us breaks the string and there's no spare or something. Mm -hmm. yeah. But uh, we are we are in the habit of switching instruments. Um, you, you may have seen us uh, pick up acoustic guitars or something, and maybe thought it was we were using the same one. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we do like to switch instruments and. Uh, I would like to play a little bass if I, but I don't have the opportunity right now. Mm -hmm. John wants to play some drums, <laughs> right? But, <laughs> but Peter's too good, so I'm, like, I'm not going to play drums while he's around. For sake of both like strats, right? Yeah. yeah. And what, what do you like about the strat? Um, it's uh, it's reliable. It's uh, it has a good edge to it, a nice cutting sort of upper mid range sound. So that uh, it'll cut through the sound of the rest of the band mm -hmm. on stage uh, for rhythm playing, right. which is really important, and it's uh, uh, it stays in tune, and um, I don't know, it feels balances well. It feels it feels good. Uh, I played a lot of other guitars uh, for different kinds of things. I have a uh, uh, an old Telecaster, uh, 55 Telecaster with a B string bender in it that uh, some man named Joe Glazer from Nashville put in for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a Guild Citron guitar. Larry and I both have Guild uh, Citron guitars that a friend of ours from Woodstock named Harvey Citron designed and licensed to Guild. And, um, you know, they have humbucking pickups in them, and they, they sustain more. They're better for certain kinds of leads than a Strat. Um, but they're not as... I don't think they're as good for 
live performances for me because they don't stay in tune as well, and they the sound gets lost in the band, especially if there's a lot of echo in the room, um, and the band starts playing loud. The, the sound gets lost. The Stratocaster that chops right through all that uh, that sonic wash. Mm -hmm. oh, I guess uh, uh, this is going to overlap with what you're just saying, but you, you're both very good uh, rhythm guitarists. So I guess that has quite a bit to do with your choice of, of guitar. I think it's important to this band. It's very important. Yeah. yeah. Sort of chop away a lot of other guitars. If you turn the volume down on, on a lot of uh, other guitars, you, you lose that uh, crispness. Mm. And uh, strat, strat, I find them just be very versatile. You, you can't really go wrong bringing a strat somewhere if you only have one guitar. Mm -hmm. yeah. The only thing a strat won't do as well as a um, as a guitar with humbucking pickups like a Les Paul uh, or a similar kind of guitar is uh, play very sustained lead lines, uh, but with processing it'll do that too. I mean, if you if you use compression on it and, mm -hmm. and other effects on it, it will uh, it will sustain. I mean, you know, both of us are using different boxes to uh, to get those sounds yeah. that well, we're all, we are all using processes to get those sounds. And Paul, the third guitar player, is also using processing. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the requirements of the band to be in the band get to have a strategy. <laughs> yeah, to play a strat. <laughs> Before 1960. <laughs> He's always um, fascinated the way you guys uh, can go back and forth between acoustic and electric, the way you use the electric guitar and the acoustic guitar. I guess you just sort of choose according to the, the particular color or tone of the song. Mm -hmm. It's just to sort of complement it. Yeah, and in, in the case of the show, it's also to give the ear some relief mm -hmm. from the, the decibel level of mm -hmm. uh, the electric music and, and, also, and from the sound of it. And uh, uh, it, I guess the same goes for a record, that a certain amount of variety is important. Uh, but I started playing uh, folk music on guitar when I was about 12. And uh, I'd played piano before that, piano and French horn. And, uh, but my first guitar was a, an acoustic uh, nylon string guitar from Sears and Roebuck that my, uh, from the Sears catalog that my parents bought for my older brother. And then I, I uh, it was the funniest thing, I got the guitar, uh, my brother got the guitar in a box and he gave it to me to, to learn how to play it so I could teach him how to play it. And, uh, <laughs> um, and it came, I thought they sent it to you tuned. It came out of the you know out of the box. And, you know, tuning was all wrong, but I learned how to play it, and I invented a whole series of fingerings for the tuning that right. was in. And then about two weeks later, he went to the library and he got a book that said how it was supposed to be tuned. And and I was really <laughs> devastated because none of my fingerings worked. And then it took me a couple more months to learn how to play it the right way after that. But then you know we got uh, I got into playing electric guitar after that. But I, I still sort of have roots in folk, folk and country and, and bluegrass. I played a little bit of bluegrass back. Uh, you know, when I was in, in my teens, and uh, it's it's nice variety. The other thing about acoustic guitar is it's really fun to write on. It's because you don't need an amplifier and a chord, and you just kind of carry it around, go out in a canoe and paddle the boat with it. I know what I've done now. Yes. Yeah. Which models? You know, I'm not even sure which models they were. Those weren't ours. We we, we have Takaminis back in the states that we use live as well. Those are right. And so we, when we came over, we just asked for Takaminis for the show. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. Skaggs, uh, who is a Martin fanatic and will only play Martins, buys Takaminis, takes the pickups out. And puts them in his Martin. Puts them in his Martin. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, the key too. Also, uh, a Gurian guitar at home. Uh -huh. It's uh, a really, really nice guitar. But I don't bring it on the road, uh, partly because the pickup isn't as good. The Takamini pickup is really excellent for live uh, work that doesn't feed back easily. And, mm. You know, it's flexible, nice graphic equalizer on it and all that. So uh, that's, uh, that's what we've been using. Mm -hmm. Excuse me, yeah. I'm gonna, I need to check in on this keyboard magazine. Mm -hmm. I'm going to come back. So I'm going to <laughs> go put my two cents in right. over there. Right, he's a keyboard player too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be back. Okay. 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 The, the minute the size of your amp at the show last night. Well, it looks small, but a boogie amp really, you know, puts out a lot of power. Um, I've been using a, a boogie for since uh, I did a tour with Little Feet in 1978, and uh, uh, when I left Orleans the, the first time, 
um, and I got a boogie up in Houston on that tour, and they were out. Little Feet was out playing with uh, oh, the Kenny Gradney had a couple of Sun bass rigs hooked together, and, and uh, uh, Lowell George and Paul Barrera both using Dumble amplifiers, and it was all very loud. And I I put the boogie amp on five, and it was plenty loud enough to mm. cut through the whole thing. It's really a very powerful amplifier. And uh, last night I think I had the master volume on three. Mm. Mm. Um, and I like it because it's small, because it's a little lighter than carrying a Marshall around or something like that. And, and uh, I actually I used Fender amps for a long time, and I still use them in the studio. Uh, I either use the Boogie or I have a, a Princeton, a Fender Princeton that's been customized to put out a little more power. It has a JBL speaker in it, and um, I used that on Still the One. It was on that whole record of uh, uh, Waking and Dreaming. So this guitar into the Princeton with a right? uh, MXR compressor, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, yeah, it's just you know, it's a good clean amp when you want it to be clean, and a distorted amp when you want it distorted. Mm -hmm. It's uh, I don't know. I've just gotten in the habit of using it. I don't know. Uh, uh, there are probably a lot of other good amplifiers out there that I should try, but I I, I don't. I just haven't gotten around to it. Well, I'm not using it anymore. I, I used to use an MXR compressor, the old Dynacomp, the red. Uh, uh, but it uh, my Dynacomp fell apart, and MXR went out of business, and I can't get another one. So uh, uh, I've been using a, a GP8, the Roland uh, uh -huh. GP8, uh, for about two years now. And uh, I like that because I can program a lot of different effects in 128 different patches of any any combination that I want. And I have it set up so that the button closest to me is my basic rhythm sound, and then the next one above that is uh, a compressed lead sound with a little bit of digital delay and a little bit of chorus on it. Uh, and then the one to the right of it is the compressed lead sound plus some overdrive and distortion. Well, wait, so, uh, when you're from this position, like, I'm well, the the uh, GP8 has a has a foot pedal mm -hmm. with, uh, yeah, it has eight. This thing's called the FC100 uh, foot pedal that Roland makes to yeah. go with it, and it has eight buttons to call up different patches. Oh, on. Okay, I see it, yeah. So the one closest to me is the sound I use for rhythm most of the time, and then, and then I have it programmed so that the further away I have to reach with my leg, you know, the less often I go there. So like my my most frequently used lead sound is is the next button up That's closest to me. me, and the next button to the side is the next distorted one, and then the next one over and up is uh, compression with more delay and more effects on it, and so on. And then there's a wah wah over further, and I, I I try to set it up so that I don't have to do this too often, you know? <laughs> and uh, so I can sing and hit the button without having to look down. Um, it's it's fun being able to uh, uh, to set up all those patches and have the uh, controller pedal uh, control how much delay or how much volume or how much distortion you can assign it to any of those functions. Yeah, so right, yeah. It's a good system. It's it's also probably obsolete by now because it is two years old and the electronics are being improved every year so much that uh, uh, you know once again there's probably something out there that would do more than that. But, mm -hmm. uh, but that's what I've been using. Hmm. Uh, how, how are the pickups set up on the guitar? You can look for yourself if you want. They're uh, um, I had like uh, uh, what happens when you switch the uh, Well it's a five position switch. Oh, I see. And uh, you know this is uh, the lead pickup, the treble pickup. And this is these two. Mm -hmm. You put in the middle, it's just this one. Mm -hmm. This is these two. This is just this one. And uh, when I bought this guitar, it had Telecaster knobs on it. And, and I like that because they're not as slippery. And uh, I tend to perspire a lot when I'm playing. And if I'm playing the, uh, the regular plastic knobs, it's, uh, it's hard to grab. And this is, it's easy to do volume knob effects with this. So, quite Telecaster knobs. Oh, I guess I'm not testing. It says like Clapton, we use these two pickups here. That's what I use most of the time. Most of the time, yeah. Yeah, that was uh, that's the sound on uh, still the one and crazy and uh, reach and probably eighty percent of the uh, 
recording I've done with this guitar is in that position with these two pickups. I'll use, uh, I'll switch to the middle position. A lot of the slide work I do is with middle position. It seems to sustain better with just this pickup on. And it's actually a little brighter. You know, the, I guess the, the, the signature, your signature sound is, you know, when you play rhythm guitar and I guess have the... In that position, yeah. yeah. Please be there and... Uh, uh, tongue tie is like that. That's just, that's the, the treble pickup. But but most of them is like that. Tongue tie is like I guess that what we, what we most associate you with are the sort of rhythm intros, especially on the first album. Yeah. Where did that idea come from? Well, that's why I was saying... Uh, um, uh, recently to somebody that, that Jimi Hendrix was my biggest influence uh, as a rhythm guitar player. You know, he was a great lead player and he was a great shucker and jiver and he had, he had big hair and a cape and all that. But, but, uh, but his rhythm guitar parts, I mean, he, he wound up with uh, every song that he did started with, uh, he was either them. Or... Or, uh, uh, will I live tomorrow? But always the guitar first. And the guitar is like a skeleton, mm -hmm. and everything else follows, you know. Uh, so for me, when I, when I write a song, I always start with a kind of bubbly rhythm guitar part. That's almost always the way I start a song. I mean, half moon. That's like right out of the Hendrix book. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just, it's much easier for me to put a song together starting from that. Um, a lot of times I'll wind up playing rhythm and having somebody else play the lead just because I think that the rhythm is so important that I'd rather play, I'd rather stay on the rhythm part. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, you know, Hendrix was... Uh, I think he worked with, uh, well, he worked with the Isley Brothers. That's you, yeah. know, you know that, but I, but I think he he learned a lot from Don Covey too. A lot of his stuff, his rhythm work came from uh, uh, was sort of the next generation of Don Covey's playing. And um, I listened to to him and to Don Covey and to uh, some of the work that Cornell Dupree and Eric Gale did in studio sessions for other people. And, uh, Jimmy Johnson, uh, Muscle Shoals uh, rhythm section, and uh, Little Beaver from the, the Criteria, uh, you know, the Clean Up Woman, you know that song? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, it's Little Beaver. And uh, um, I just always admired that kind of uh, rhythm playing. So uh, that's that's what I do. <laughs> <laughs> And he just said that's what he always admired about you, and I guess well, he always associated that with your, your sound. The nice thing about uh, contemporary music is that it's all passed down, you know, from one person to another. I feel like I just, I got this stuff from a number of other musicians mm -hmm. and you know every once in a while I hear somebody doing something that people will say gee that sounds like you you know mm -hmm. and, and it's it's a really an honor to feel like I'm part of a chain yeah. where I you know I pass things on in a slightly different form mm -hmm. to whoever's listening next one of the things you have going for you is that you you know you seem to have a style of your own we don't seem to we don't notice any like slavish Im imitation on your part just John Hall sound. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, that's that's good. I think it's taken a while for that to evolve. Well, seventy, what is it? Seventy-two when the first album yeah. came out. Yeah, but I mean, I was playing guitar for a long while before that, uh -huh. and uh, and there was a time when you probably would have heard some slavish annotations. <laughs> but uh, I, I actually, somewhere along the way, I stopped listening so much to other people. And because I was so busy doing my own music, and I think that at that point you you sort of go off on your own path, and um, and it probably was in the '70s, you know, right, probably right around that time I started to really do that, uh, where rather than sit around and listen to a, a Jeff Beck or Jimi Hendrix or Eric Clapton or whoever record, I would um, 
I would be busy writing or be busy practicing or be busy recording something and you only have so many hours in the day and it, just, it tends to cut down on the listening that you do to other things. Um, and recently I've been working on uh, writing and recording with a woman from Nashville named Joan L. Mosser who's a really terrific R&B rock singer. She's uh, uh, I think going to be a big star and uh, thanks. And. Um, you know, and I, I wind up in the studio with her and then listening to the tapes to sort of critique them and figure out what to do next and what to put on them. And, and uh, it becomes work to an extent. Not that, it, not that it's unpleasant, but it becomes uh, all-consuming. So you don't... Uh, I don't have as much time to listen to music recreationally. I don't sit around... I've been listening recently to, uh, to Sting's new record. That's sort of my current... Uh, Favorite. And there are a couple cuts on the new ZZ Top record that I really like too. But I, but uh, I, uh, you know, I don't get to uh, check out all the new releases by everybody. And, and, uh, so maybe that has something to do with it that I, I don't, uh, I don't imitate uh, as much as I would if I were really listening to a mm -hmm. lot of other people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you assume that you've been like uh, heavily influenced by country and folk and bluegrass. Yeah, yeah. I, I, uh, I played guitar, uh, you know, folk guitar originally, and I played uh, banjo and mandolin and guitar in a bluegrass band when I was in college. Thanks. And um, um, I had a steel pedal steel guitar for a while, and I played that. And I and I have this Telecaster with a B string bender in it still. And uh, I, I've actually spent a lot of time in Nashville in the last few years. Uh, uh, I had a great time going around with uh, uh, when I first started going to Nashville. Uh, Bruce Bowden, who was the steel player with Ricky Skaggs at the time, and Ray Flack, and uh, and Bucky Baxter, who, who plays with Steve Earle. And I, the four of us, would go around and sit in at all these clubs. And uh, uh, in Nashville, they have all these clubs that are sort of uh, tourist bars mm -hmm. where uh, they have a house band, and anybody can come and sign up to play, to sit in. You know, they have a sign-up list where you can put your name down in the instrument you might play, and then they'll call you up at some point. And, uh, and so the four of us guys would go and just take the place over. We'd just take the <laughs> stage. One by one, we'd get up there, and then pretty soon the, 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 their band would be all gone, except maybe the drummer and bass player. And uh, and that was that was really a lot of fun, um, but uh, you know it's it's an influence for me. You know, country is not. Uh, um, I don't think I could be happy just doing that, uh, but it's fun in the same way that blues is fun because it's a very structured form. It's that you only have certain notes that you use in certain chord progressions, and it's operating in a confined space, so that. Uh, you have to be creative in a, in using those limited number of choices in a in a different way. Um, what I always admired about Leslie West, um, or or for that matter, uh, ZZ, ZZ Top, you know, Billy Gibbons and ZZ Top, is that uh, they're so strict about only playing the basic blues notes, <laughs> and and sometimes I wish they would do something different, yeah, you know, yeah. because. Uh, um, it gets boring to me to hear, you know, the same uh, choices of notes and of chords on everything. But but what's good about it, though, is that they play those notes with utter conviction. It's like, you know, no doubt about this one, you know, I'd really lay into it. And uh, um, I guess it's a discipline, you know, that's why you, sometimes it's good to have uh, limits like that put on. So, blues most likely. Constantly, stories there. Start to work on you. Okay. You use a much bigger, a much larger amp than John. I do. I guess. Well, last um, night you did. I. Uh, oh yeah. Well, uh, I don't think power. I think his is actually more powerful. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, the Marshall is a large amp. I never use a Marshall in America. I have I have a bunch of old Fender amps, mm -hmm. a couple of basements, an old mm -hmm. Tremolux that I just got, mm -hmm. mid fifties. And um, I bought my first basement in 1968. It's a 56. I still have it. And I still use it. And so uh, I'm fairly much of a, a purist in the sense that uh, 
I haven't gone in for a digital processing or having a rack. You know, I just like a couple of pedals and my guitar in my hand, and I'm very satisfied with that. Mm. Um, so where, where did the Marshalls come from? Well, the Marshalls were just uh, what our what our road crew asked for mm -hmm. um, because it seemed like it's too expensive to fly our our gear yeah. over here. I see. Yeah, we came with our guitars, and that's it. Is that right? Yeah. You know, all so the all the equipment is re is rented, and I supplied, yeah. Yeah. and so the Marshalls were what we asked for to have over here because we couldn't get we we didn't want to ask for fifty six basins. <laughs> You never know what you're going to get if you ask for an old amplifier. You know, it's, oh, it can be. It depends on how well it's maintained and what kind of condition the tubes are in. And so. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, we'll talk, the Marshall seemed to work out great because it wasn't distorted or anything. Right? It it's good yeah, sounding. It sound really good. Yeah. I'm happy with it. Yeah. I know. You said you're a purist. You said, well, if you have the chops, the, you know, people with the chops can afford to be purists. Uh, <laughs> thank, thank the rest you. of us <laughs> may have to depend a little more on the technology. Study that. the sound on the, uh, the harmony parts. The singing? Yeah. Oh, the guitar. Oh, the guitar. Oh, yeah, the still um, well, something like Still the One really was was created in the studio. Uh, John would play a solo. Um, John put his solo together. I would coach him while he was out there. And then he would coach me while I went out and just sort of played a harmony part to the solo that we decided uh, we liked of his. So there was really no forethought. It was just sort of making it up as we go along. Mm -hmm. And um, and ever since we made the record, that's the solo that we, you know, we've learned our own solo to play live. We learned it off the record. And we learned it off the record. <laughs> um, but uh, Let There Be Music, for example, I think that I, I sort of wrote that out. I sort of had this thing in my mind when I wrote that the song. one. Yeah, that one you yeah. did work out. But that's unusual. Most of the stuff is more um, impromptu, mm -hmm. improvisational. Yeah. No, many parts evolved on stage, like in Breakdown, the section at mm -hmm. the end where oh, we play yeah, right, right, right. the three-part guitar uh, thing. That's something that we evolved for you know over a period of years. And then when Paul joined the band, mm -hmm. we added some stuff to it. We you know we we had his guitar playing a third harmony part. And as we were working it out with him, we added some more parts. And then last night, we wound up, because we were out in the audience, we didn't get back in time for the end of the, uh, uh, where the song would ordinarily end. We, we added another section, and I, I started playing. A, we can actually do this, you know, without, without knowing in advance what we're going to do. Either Larry or I, or Paul, can, um, can harmonize spontaneously with another line. But he, we started playing another another variation on it when we got back up on the stage last night that was not that hadn't been worked out so it's uh, uh, you know some of these things stay the same from night to night and other ones will change you guys I guess when you harmonize on guitars pretty much keep the tones the tones of the guitars the same the, the sound of the guitar. Try to get a blend, you yeah. know. We, the it just ends up that way, I guess. Yeah. 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 We have time for one last question here. That's okay. your, your advice to aspiring guitar players, himself included. <laughs> um, Practice. Uh, I think there's no substitute for, for time spent with, yeah. your, with your hands on the guitar, mm -hmm. you know, with, with your with your hands on the strings. And, uh, and listen to as, as many uh, people play who's playing you find um, you can relate to um, for inspiration and uh, sort of pick up on how it's done. Mm -hmm. And I'll also I'd say to, to record yourself. Mm. That's a good idea. Even just with a little cassette player. Yes, yeah, so Record you yourself because... Uh, it's the same way your voice never sounds the same coming back off tape as you think it is. Uh, uh, the same is true of guitar. Mm. And um, in order to refine your phrasing uh, or your tone, uh, a lot of times the guitar sounds different uh, from the stage than it does from in the audience, for instance. And you might think you've got one sound, and then you know from the audience it'll sound 
either duller or brighter or more echoey or not as echoey. Um, so it's, it's always good to have that reference point so you make sure that the audience will hear uh, what you want them to hear. Listen to a lot of Orleans records. <laughs> <laughs> I think there was one thing that probably should have been asked here, but who was the who was this guy Mike, the third guitar player? Oh, Paul. Paul, 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 Paul Brannon. Yeah, there's a, there, there's a tiger loose in that man's soul. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> he's amazing. Um, Paul played with uh, uh, Levon Helm, mm -hmm. and uh, he's played with a number of people, but that's who I first heard him with. And he played on some sessions for Larry, uh, some recordings that Larry was doing, mm -hmm. and. Uh, we just started working with him, what, last spring? Mm -hmm. uh, and the thing about Paul that I like is he practices all the time. He must practice, well, I don't know. Here in Japan, he's probably out sightseeing, but, mm -hmm. but six, six to eight hours a, a day. I mean, he practices all the time. I gave him a hard time. We were, we were uh, traveling to a gig in New England somewhere in America, and... and uh, between the sound check, between the sound check and the show, we had an hour. We went back to the hotel. We had about an hour, and we got we're getting out of the car. And I said, "Gee, maybe you ought to practice. Well, you know, bring your guitar in and practice." And I was kidding, you know. And, he, and so he took his guitar and said, "That's a good idea." And he took it in, and sure enough, he was in there. I mean, you always hear him in his room practicing. What does he do when he practices? Like, how does he practice? Uh, he plays scales and arpeggios, and he plays and he ju just plays licks. He just noodles on stuff, you know. But but. Uh, uh, it's really good for me and Larry. We're really enjoying having him because uh, it's, it's fun to listen to. And also he's challenging to us. He pushes us yeah. to play more yeah. and better. Yeah. And I think we might get a little complacent if we didn't have some new blood coming in like that. Yeah. He and Peter are both the same way. They both, Peter O'Brien, our, our new drummer, are, uh, bring a lot of fire and uh, you know, good new energy to the band. Yeah, I forgot to ask you one of the gauge in your strings. What you guys Ten to fifty-two. Same. Mm -hmm. That's easy. <laughs> <laughs>